Hi guys, it's Mrs. Wilkowski, just here to talk about our next unit. We're going to be talking, it's a very short unit on biotechnology. So one of the first things that we have to do is review a little bit about what we remember about DNA. And hopefully, if you have reviewed your five facts about DNA at this point um, with your group, you have realized that DNA is made up of these nucleotides, cytosine, always bonds with guanine and adenine always bonds with thymine. That was the base pairing rule. Another fact that you might have come up with in your group is that hydrogen bonds are very weak bonds that hold these two nitrogen bases together. A third fact is that the nucleotides are actually a region of one nitrogen base attached to a sugar, attached to a phosphate molecule, and they look sort of L-shaped like this. So that is a nucleotide, and a nucleotide has all three of those parts, and that when DNA makes more DNA, we call that process replication. And finally, the sides of the DNA molecule are made up of sugars and phosphates. Here is a sugar and you can see we have many of those down this side. Sorry, I'm touching it with my pinky and it's messing it up. And then these little guys that I'm going to color, we'll make them green. Nope, that's too big. Uh, we'll make them red. The little red things here, these are the phosphates. And they're just too small for me to write inside. So these are the phosphate molecules. So we have together a phosphate sugar and uh, an attached nitrogen base makes the nucleotides. And we can build the DNA molecule out of these building blocks called nucleotides. We call these nucleotides by their nitrogen base because that is the only part of the nucleotide that's different. So even though we only write down the letter G, A, C, when we're talking about DNA, recall that these letters stand for the entire nucleotide. So the topic that we're going to be talking about today is genetic engineering. And genetic engineering, very simply, is the process whereby we can make changes in the genes, those letters, or the sequence of DNA in organisms. And historically, we changed the genes of organisms through breeding. Uh, here we have a picture of a gray wolf, and in different regions of the world, we were able to selectively breed the gray wolf and come up with all the different lines of dogs that we have today. Um, and we call that process sometimes artificial selection because man is selecting the traits, the desired traits that we want to breed this animal to produce. Um, so we could selectively breed to make a hybrid, and a hybrid or hybridization is when we cross dissimilar individuals through trial and error, and we're looking to make offspring that has the best of both breeds. We call this hybrid vigor because the offspring are extremely healthy. And if you look down here, if you look at breed A of corn and breed B. They're both very short. Um, they don't seem to have a lot of kernels on them. There wouldn't be a lot of food produced by these two breeds of corn. But when you cross breed A and breed B and you get a hybrid here, it's much healthier, much larger, has a lot more kernels. It provides more food. So this is what we did. We originally got this kind of corn from the Native Americans when the first Europeans landed in the United States and we were able to do some hybridization to produce the corn that we eat today, which is a much tastier and heartier variety of corn. Another use of selective breeding is inbreeding. Sometimes we breed organisms purely uh, we cross organisms that have similar traits because we want to create a pure breed. Gregor Mendel, he did this with pea plants. He wanted to make sure he had pure breeds before he started his, started his experiments. And we tend to do this with dogs because we tend to have one feature about the animal that we prefer. Um, down here, the Chihuahua is one pure breed. I think this is a pit bull, I'm not a dog person. 
So I'm not really sure about some of these other breeds, but you may recognize them. And so each of these varieties of dog is a pure breed. So how else can we change genes other than just breeding organisms to produce changes? Well, a third way we can change the genes of an organism now is by actually going in and engineering or changing the genes. And of course a gene is a piece of DNA. So we're going in and we're literally changing the DNA by cutting, adding, and removing pieces of it. And we can maybe insert the desired gene into another animal's genome. And if you look at this picture down here, this is called the Vacanti mouse. This was one of the first transgenic organisms because it has mouse, it's mainly a mouse, but it has, I'm sure you recognize this, it's the human ear. And what they did was they took the, the, uh, the DNA that coded for cartilage in the human ear and spliced it into the cartilage cells of this mouse and they used it to create the human ear so that it could be transplanted onto a person. And I think initially this first one was done just for research purposes to see if it could be done. Um, but of course, the, you can take genes from two different organisms and literally put them together. We call that splicing them together. So um, in order to understand this process, one of the words you have to know is the word genome. A genome is the entire sequence of DNA uh, that codes for an organism. So we're talking about all the letters that make this mouse a mouse. Um, and in order to be able to work with research organisms, we would have to first determine their genome. We'd need to know what genes produce which traits and which genes are critical genes so we know not to destroy them when we're cutting into the DNA. And if we look at a human's genome and we determine all those letter sequences, then we can splice genes into it and produce the traits of both, like they've done here with the mouse and the human ear. So when we work with genetic engineering, we need several tools. First of all, we extracted DNA in class, and if you will recall that process, the first thing we had to do was separate the DNA from all the other cell parts. So we mixed it with a buffer, which was a solution of water, dishwashing detergent, and salt. And the dishwashing detergent broke down the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane, and the salt bound with the extra proteins, and those components fell away, and we were left with DNA in solution. And then when we poured in the cold alcohol with the DNA, the DNA precipitated or formed a solid and floated to the top. So we would use a similar procedure to that to extract DNA in genetic engineering. You'd first want to separate it away from the rest of the cell. The second thing you would do is you would cut the DNA. And to do that, you need molecular scissors that we call restriction enzymes. And these restriction enzymes, if you look where this scissor is cutting, it's cutting between the C and the T here. So we're not talking about breaking the two bases away from each other. That can happen um, just by separating that hydrogen bond there. But we're talking about literally cutting between the C and the T where the scissor is. And if you look down here, it produces something that we call a sticky end, which means it's uneven. And if you look here, where did this break occur? Well, if we used a restriction enzyme here, this restriction enzyme recognizes a certain sequence of nitrogen bases and along the top here it's always going to break between the T and the G or down at the bottom here it broke between the T and the A, thymine and adenine. So whenever this particular restriction enzyme is used, and I'll draw in so you can see better, it would make a zigzag cut like this and it leaves an uneven end. Now what what that means is whenever these letters T, A, and T are mixed in solution with their perfect match and of course what always bonds with T? 
A, adenine, would bond here with thymine. Thymine would bond with adenine and adenine here. So whenever they see this sequence in solution on any organi organism's DNA, that will bond right there. So we could splice in another gene. So what sequence of letters will match the sticky end shown below? And again, we're saying what would bond here with the T? Do you remember? We'd need A, A, T bonds with A, and T bonds with A. So if we had another organism's gene here, and we'll draw it in red, that had these same letters, then that would join up here and we could splice that organism's gene into onto this sticky end. So up here, number three, what is another tool of genetic engineering? Well, if you're going to work with DNA, you have to be able to separate certain pieces of it out. And the procedure that we use to separate DNA by size is called gel electrophoresis. And in this process, what you do is you take a DNA sample and you mix it with a restriction enzyme which cuts it into different fragments. You place those fragments by micropipetting it down into these little wells here. And then you take this whole rectangular piece, it's called a gel, and you set that into the chamber, the electrophoresis chamber. You cover it with a solution that's an electrolyte and will conduct electricity. And then you plug this chamber in and you run current through it. And the current causes these DNA pieces up here, these are negatively charged. And if you look over here, on this side of the electrophoresis chamber, you can see there is a positive attraction. That's, that's a positive sign right there. So the negatively charged DNA, when you run current through the solution, will move through the gel this way toward the positive terminal. And they end up separating themselves by size. And you'd get something that looks like this down at the bottom, which we call a banding pattern or a DNA fingerprint. Another tool that you would use if you're working on genetic engineering is sometimes you have a very small amount of DNA and you need to make more of it. So if you need to make more copies of DNA before you can work with it, you can use this process called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. And PCR basically imitates the process that occurs in DNA replication. We can have these two strands of DNA or a single molecule and if we add the same enzyme that causes DNA to replicate itself we can turn that into two and those two can become four and so forth and so on just by putting that enzyme in there with it and the process is actually a little more complicated than that but we'll go with that for now so we can take a small amount of DNA if this were the original sample we can imitate the process of DNA replication and use it to make a large amount of DNA. And we call that amplifying the DNA, making more of it. So, what DNA process, what DNA making process that occurs before a cell divides does PCR imitate? Again, that would be replication. So down here, this is a picture of replication. You can see that uh, here's the DNA molecule. It's unwound. And here is DNA polymerase, which is also used in PCR. And polymerase um, moves from one end to the other. On this side, polymerase is moving inward. On this side, polymerase is building outward. Uh, DNA always builds in different directions. 
And remember, we called this process semi 